what I have like two major ones left. The other one is like I have to fucking make turkey, dude. Like this is like a normal fucking Thursday. Like I'm pretty sure Crash was just looking for like filler shit. But we'll do it anyways. I have to make pinnock jot. That's what turkey is, right? Wait, what the fuck is pinnock jot? Today, I'm gonna teach you how to make pinochet with root mash. First, you will need to prepare some meat according to the package you have. We soaked it for 24 hours and changed the water three times. You will also need some burr sticks or a steamer rack. So you will first put them on the bottom of a pot and then add the meat on top and add some water underneath and you will let it steam for two hours and a half. Then you will need some roots. For that, we used some rutabaga, some carrots, some potatoes. Yeah, Soaking King sent me some like prepackaged shit like this. I shouldn't use this. Then you will need some roots. For that, we used some rutabaga, some carrots, some potatoes, some parsley root, and some celery roots. So we cut everything into cubes and we covered it with water. We added a bit of salt and we let it cook for 30 minutes. After that, you will remove the water and then you will crush it with some pinochet sauce. I mean, the water we cooked the pinochet with and some cream. Usually the mash should be orange, but oh, since shit. we used purple carrots, it's a bit pinkish. So here's the meat. You can broil it to have an extra crispiness. Then you can serve it. Root mash, a bit of meat, and that's it. It tastes really good. So... Oh, that looks good, dude. What is that? Is that fucking lamb? What is that shit? Yeah, but the meat part, shit looks kind of like jerky, dude. It's just bones? Why do they eat it if it's just bones? That's like fucking Great Depression type beat. No, I'm not giving that to my dog. Because if you give that to your dogs and it's like broiled or whatever, boiled, the bones can split and stuff. Ew, the salty shit again, bro. What is it with you guys, man? Oh, okay. I see. Oh, okay, okay, got it, got it, got it. <laughs> what up, no answer? Bro, the last thing I had from Sweden was like some rotten fish in a fucking can. <laughs> I mean, that was some kind of disgusting joke. <laughs> um, where's the wait? What is this? Gordon Ramsay headed to Norway to learn how to cook like a true Viking. But how this region I think developed I've seen some this. of its traditional dishes happened long before these explorers took to the seas. I want to move to Norway. <laughs> <laughs> One second. The Sami people are indigenous to the Sampi region, which includes northern parts of Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. They're descendants of nomadic peoples, who've inhabited the region for thousands of years. Their population today is estimated to be around 80,000, with about half currently living in Norway. Despite their relatively small population size, Sami people have had a huge influence on Nordic culture, and even in feature films, like Frozen 2. But one of their biggest influences is in their cuisine. Traditionally, the Sami were hunter-gatherers that feasted on in-season berries and animal-based meals like reindeer meat and fish. The meats were preserved through salting and drying. 
communal reindeer herding later replaced hunting and became an integral part of the Sami economy. How many are in the herd? Uh, what's your fortune? I think Magna is trying to tell me that it's rude to ask a Sami about the size of their herd. Culturally, the Sami people used all parts of the animal so that nothing would go to waste. Are, are, they, are they warm? Yes, warm. Man, man, mm -hmm. you, so you waste nothing? No, no, no. No waste, at even at the shoe. I mean, could you yeah. make them my size, size 15? Oh, expensive. <laughs> Animal byproducts like hides, bones, and blood were used for clothing, tools, and even other meals. Blood pancakes, anyone? Ew, what the fuck? I actually like the flavor. Mm -hmm. The texture's quite thick mm -hmm. and dense. And now, onto the Vikings. The Viking Age started around the late 8th century, where Danish, Norwegian, and Swedish warriors took to the seas to raid and colonize other parts of Europe. To meet the high energy demands of a Viking lifestyle, High fat foods were a necessity, especially in winter months. Vikings were comprised of independent farmers, and when on land, they surprisingly had a good amount of variety in their diet. This included cereals, animal milks, wild fruit and berries, and a wide variety of meat, including horses, pigs, goats, and sheep. This is a sheep head. How far does this date back? 900 Viking, century. Yeah, Viking to you. The Vikings. Wow. Uh, fish and fresh shellfish like scallops bro i don't know if you guys caught this earlier but you guys know ahmed he just found out recently that he can get a dog it's not haram so he's gonna be getting a dog within the next year and that fucking sick dude were also staples both at land and at sea i'm amazed how sweet they are that's a big shock for me like the Sami, Vikings were not known to let food go to waste. Pernus. Domestic animals were first used as working animals, then later eaten, which led to established delicacies like sheep's head. Boiling meat exciting? and stews was a great way to help meals stretch and stay flavorful. For example, in a Viking scouse, meat and vegetables were Whoa, taken when's out the of last the time you had a dog? and replaced with new ones. This allowed for the broth to be extra concentrated throughout the days of cooking. Also like the Sami, meat and fish were Ew. often dried and salted oh. for long-term preservation. From the indigenous... This is like some cheesecake someone left out for like... It's someone's grandma left out the fucking cheesecake 400 years ago. She left it out for like six weeks. And then like a holiday came where all the family came and she had to act like it was some special dish. And then they just started doing that every year. Like, I swear some of the shit they come up with. Like, is that aged? What is that? Are you dumb? What? You said this is cheesecake. It's like old fucking cheesecake. It will turn green. Oh, green is like uh, like mold, right? Or it ferments. Caramelized cheese. That okay. All right. All this this is gonna show like. Let me see. I always thought that that meant like a fancy way to say it's fucking mold. Am I the only one that thought that? I always thought that there was always fancy. It's all right, let's see. Okay, all right. Oh, so it's <clears throat> it's like a puffy. It's like puffy. Wait. <coughs> how did how did it find its way over here? <clears throat> South Korea, huh? I like goat milk cheeses. I I really like uh what's I guess it's goat cheese. 
I'm a big fan of goat cheese. Is this similar? I like the stench. Traditions of the Sami to the conquering spirits of the Vikings, Norwegian cuisine and food preparation has survived for centuries. And while some of the dishes may look a little different today, their roots will remain for generations to come. Want to see more for my Uncharted adventures? Please click here to watch more clips. Nah. Nah, Gordon. Nah. It was a major crime scene. Several people had told me often the shooter is watching in the crowd. And so when we walked out, I was very nervous at just being watched. Yeah, fuck that. <laughs> One sec. Found something else. The Ryong Hotel is the tallest building in North Korea at 330 meters. It is located in the heart of Pyongyang. The metropolis is full of pretentious showy monuments and buildings. This pyramid overshadows it all, literally. You can still see the building from several kilometers away. It was meant to become the tallest hotel in the world and a flagship of the country. Construction started over 30 years ago. Just a few years later, a rough framework was in place. Nevertheless, the hotel has not hosted a single guest to this day. The entire building has been empty for decades. Why? What does it look like from the inside, and will anyone ever be able to stay there? We will take you to the so-called Hotel of Doom. Ooh. North Korea is one of the most isolated countries in the world. The totalitarian regime hardly ever allows real glimpses into life in the dictatorship. But how North Korea appears to the outside world is extremely important to the country. The government built numerous prestigious monuments in the capital <coughs> Pyongyang. Magnificent skyscrapers and impressive statues are meant to prove how modern, rich, and stable the country is. In order to understand the Ruyong Hotel, we need to take a brief look at the history of the country. Until 1945, Korea is a Japanese colony. This changes with the capitulation of Japan in the Second World War. Korea is divided between the victorious powers into two occupation zones. The South is occupied by the USA, the North by the Soviet Union. As a result, South Korea ultimately develops into a democracy and opens up to the world. North Korea becomes a totalitarian state under the flag of communism. The two countries become enemies. The conflict culminates in the Korean War in 1950. It lasts for three years and claims over four million lives. This war cements the division of Korea. Since then, this line at the 38th parallel has separated the citizens of the peninsula. There may have been a ceasefire since the end of the war, but there are still violent incidents from time to time. The relationship remains frosty. Let's jump ahead a few decades. South and North Korea are still arch enemies. In 1986, a South Korean company builds a hotel in Singapore. It is the tallest hotel in the world at the time. Two years later, South Korea hosts the Olympics, insane prestige for a country. The North Korean dictator at the time, Kim Il-sung, the leader from 1949 to 1994, doesn't like these developments at all. So the regime strikes back. In 1989, North Korea hosts the World Festival of Youth and Students. More than 10,000 people from 177 countries visit the capital. In the run-up, the country is spending $4 billion to glam up Pyongyang for its visitors. The money is used to build new roads and stadiums. And there are also plans for a new hotel. It is intended to surpass that of the South Koreans by 104 meters. The highest hotel in the world would from now on be in North Korea. For comparison, it would be a decent bit higher than the Eiffel Tower. The plans for the Ruyong Hotel are unique. It looks like the, the elixir. building is designed to have three wings, each inclined at an angle of 75 degrees, converging towards a cone at the top. The shape is reminiscent of a pyramid, a mountain, or perhaps even a rocket. Around 3,000 rooms are spread over 105 floors. In total, the hotel has 360,000 square meters of usable space. It will also house a bowling alley and a nightclub. At the pinnacle of the hotel, at the very top of the cone, there is space for five restaurants. To really enjoy the 360-degree panorama, this part will even be able to rotate. 
1987, North Korea begins to build the hotel. Two years later, just in time for the World Festival, it is to be ceremoniously opened. Floor after floor of the 105 stories are built. The building shell climbs higher and higher, but it soon becomes clear that an opening just two years after the start of the construction was a bit too ambitious. The international guests are put in other hotels instead. The date for the opening is postponed to 1992. But in 1991, the Soviet Union collapses. The Cold War is over. With the end of the USSR, North Korea loses its most important backer and supporter. A year later, the hotel has reached its 330 meter height and now towers over everything in its vicinity. But it is far from finished. The ceremonial opening never takes place. At that time, construction has already cost 750 million US dollars. North Korea lacks the money to continue. In 1993, work is stopped completely. And for a long, long time. Holy shit, that's The once prestigious project has become the nation's eyesore. The hotel doesn't even have windows. That's hideous. Only the gray shell remains. A gloomy concrete colossus. On the roof, an abandoned crane rusts away for years. Meanwhile, the North Korean population suffers from dire poverty. At the same time, the country is also plunging into a severe economic crisis. A massive famine breaks out. Supply shortages, power outages, no health care. Kim Jong-il is now the country's new dictator. He doesn't want to show any weakness to the outside world. In many cases, he refuses urgently needed humanitarian aid for political reasons. Around the same time, the Ruyang Hotel suddenly disappears from official photographs. The regime has pictures of Pyongyang partially edited before they are published. The miserable condition of the site, emblematic of the country's decline, is erased. You bulldoze that thing, dude. Almost 15 years after construction was halted, things are suddenly moving forward. The Egyptian telecommunications group Arascom is tasked to finally complete the hotel's window and facade construction as part of a larger deal. In 2011, Kim Jong-il dies. His son, Kim Jong-un, comes to power. In the same year, work on the hotel is completed. Oh. The German luxury hotel group, Kempinski, announces that it will create 150 hotel rooms in the upper part of the building. The long-awaited opening of the prestigious building is finally within reach, but it's in vain. In 2013, Kempinski cancels the project due to heightened political tensions between North Korea and the West. To this day, the hotel has never been opened. No one is allowed to enter the building. Not a single guest has ever stayed in one of the countless planned rooms. <laughs> and now carries the nickname, Hotel of Doom. Even the most beautiful- This was like the longest fucking- Beautiful facade cannot distract from the fact that the walls inside are beginning to crumble. Experts suggest the hotel's construction isn't really solid. The huge That is the most drawn out L I've ever heard. Mm. Uh. Uh. Mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. What up, Toss a lot in. Like, you know, the canal's right here. All we got to do is... This is from a long time ago. This is what it looks like when a bird gets a new feather. Don't they use these to write with? Like, pins? Holy sh... Oh my god, okay. This is what it looks like when a bird... Maybe like... Yeah. You, want, you want a new GPU? Nope. I'll give you a new GPU. Hell yeah, dude. That'd be that'd be great. But Ready? I don't know if my uh, my uh, my uh, CPU would be able to handle the new GPU. But how about this? If I can beat you in a foot race, if you can get it to get up, you can get a free meal. What? So I get this for free if I turn that it's the right way round without spilling a drop. Yes. Do you have crisps? I do. Oh no, you call them chips, right? Crisps. Chips. 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 We have. So what do you call them? Chips. Chips. What do you call them? Chips? Chips. No, they're crisps. <laughs> now you're probably thinking, what's he doing emptying the crisps, right? Because how is this going to get that Guinness to turn the right way up? Very smart. 
Yeah, you like that too, right? <laughs> I, I, he spilled a shit ton of that beer, oh, dude. Oh, guess the card, win the card. Oh, goodness. Uh, is it red? No. Is it green? No. Is it blue? No. Is it black? No. Is it colorless? <clears throat> what the fuck is that? I'm afraid I braced myself, bro. <laughs> Here's the part where we send it off. Well, it's been a great stream. It's been a wonderful uh, and warm, cozy day and night. Good morning. Good night. Everything in between. Appreciate you guys. Love you. I will see you again very, very soon. Um, DJ Change, what up, dude? Much love, guys. Thanks for hanging out with me. Take care of yourself.